further ado, here's Leo, and I think it's computer set up, so, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, yeah, my name is Leo, and now I'm actually working in cruise automations, um, working on machine learning stuff. So, but this is not related to machine learning. Um, I'm actually working on the machine learning deployment part, how to run a model largely, that I'm actually looking into how to blend two things together. But not yet, okay. Let's actually get back to the topic itself. So um, this is actually the first time that I talk through this deck. So feel free to actually interrupt me if you don't know what I'm talking about, or maybe, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> that happens. <laughs> so let's get started. Um, so usually this is how a startup actually started, okay? Um, sorry about that, we'll get, I get, actually get you to read the code on the slide. But at the very beginning, Okay, I have the mouse here. At the very beginning, and then you actually select a domain, okay, and then depends on the domain, then you have some random difficulties for your company to be successful. Okay, and then you actually have, a, oh, sorry, you have a progress, so you randomly actually have something in progress, and then you have some amount of money, okay, the money actually passes in from the investor, and then if the progress is larger than zero, and money larger than zero, and then you randomly do something, okay, this is a step functions, and then you every single iteration your money reduce certain amount right and then at the end result will be either you run out of money or you're successful you consume all the progress that you need to do right that's actually what a startup is and then why i'm talking about that is actually related to how to manage a startup so um Comics law, right? Any organization that design a system will inevitably, will inevitably produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. Basically, is if you design your organization first, and then your architecture will same as your organization's. If you design your system first, ideally, do it right, and then you can build the organization around it, and then you have a good team, rather than have a team that just build on the, the, the wrong architectures. So, so let's get back to um, uh, um, the iteration speed of the period slide. So we need to actually focus on per day iteration throughput, right? So in order, in order for us to survive longer, and then to, to actually make it like uh, 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 the best outcome, then we need to improve that. And then you need to have more people to scale the team. Scale is not just like hiring more, but better productivity, <laughs> quantity, and qualities. Okay, and also you scale the architectures. Okay, because once you have you 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 need to have a good architecture so that you can stack scale the team. So fundamentally, if you really look at how startup actually get built up at some stage, and then you really need to actually think about your architectures. Because if you don't actually think about it, you just keep throwing in people there, and then you get a really dimension return. So. Um, this is journey actually started. So I should actually have a um, a growth graph here. It's a, it was actually all exponential growth. So um, Seattle actually has unicorn, right? You know that. So has unicorn startup. So just make sure that you guys know about that. It's not just San Francisco has that. <laughs> <laughs> so and LinkedIn. Okay, I joined the company around at the end of two thousand fifteen. Uh, my mission was um, helping them to scale from the engineering side, okay? Because we already know that we have a lot of money at that point. So we are going to hire from 10 engineers all the way up to 100. So 2016, 10, 2017, just hundreds, okay? And then 2016, we have a big fat monolith that if you hire more people, they just step on each other. It's impossible to actually scale. Scale comes in part. One part it is your productivity needs to be scaled. The second part of that is your system don't die, right? So um, at that point, the big fat monolith, you actually pretty much are actually getting like five outage for the side outage per week. Um, and then as we actually hire more people, we just realize that people are just sitting on the bench and they just step on each other. And this is a very classic case that we need to actually build an architecture that scale. Um, so these are the number that comparing to before and after. So we have 10, grow to 100. Uh, we have um, a big monolith, 
and then by 2018, we have 40 plus services. Um, we are 100% native on AWS. There's no data center. There's no cross cloud. So it's just making the things actually much simpler. Um, solutions is service much different microservice architecture evolution. It's kind of weird statement. I will change this one later. <laughs> so let's move on. So, um, yes. So um, LinkerD actually, I think at that point, LinkerD actually is the first revision of the LinkerD actually is released, I think, 2016. Um, I was actually the first batch of the people actually adopt to that. Uh, why? Um, just like most of the LinkedIn people here, uh, we all work at Twitter. So by default, we have to trust. <laughs> and I know Fidango. <laughs> okay, I, I know Scala, right? And then I know Netty pretty well, so I know how to debug it, and then other people don't. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and then at that point, it's because we, we understand the, the, the problem of the scale and then collectively, and then we learn all this lesson from Twitter. Then we actually know that we need to control all the traffic. At that point, uh, we I actually started a project called Traffic Control, right? It's weird, but that, that's what it was. And it's, LinkedIn has a one set, LinkedIn V1, it lost in V2. I hope that it come back on V2. It has a very powerful DSL for routing. So you can actually literally actually making any two points, the linkage between any two points becomes soft, become programmable. So you can actually say, oh, uh, uh, for 50% of the service go to chat service, go to chat V1, another 50% go to chat V2. You can control something like that. Um, I will just show you the example. Um, the last bit, I think um, this would actually um, uh, be demonstrated uh, majority in the talk here is it's a very powerful parking system. But granted, it is a JVM, so you can actually pretty much just write your JVM code and then put it together and then they load your JVM code into into that at runtime. So you have the powerful, very powerful uh, uh, system here. Um, but for clarity purpose, um, because everyone actually knows Scala code is very long, right? And then I don't want you to actually read the code in Scala on the slide deck. I revise them in Python. <laughs> Just make it easier to read. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I saw the face. I love Scala, by the way. So um, so this talk is about the architecture evolution from, um, from monolith to microservice driven by service mm -hmm. mesh. So um, the whole development process itself, it is um, uh, uh, when we're actually breaking down monolith, we don't just say, oh, we plan out how to break down monolith. But instead, it's actually the whole cycle of how we actually deploy Linkerd into our stack. While we are deploying Linkerd into stack, we actually break, break it down the things, use Linkerd to glue the things together. So it is actually a, I would call that is a mesh driven deployment. So this is something that uh, uh, I think that's super useful. And it's actually very pragmatic and systematic solutions. Um, if we do it again, I can probably actually tell you how to do it again. So um, it's imperfect solutions. Um, we, we, we know that the area that we need to improve, or we don't know, but um, it, it, with the full respect of the legacy, right? So because every system, actually every startup when they actually grow up, they have a lot of legacy there. So uh, we try not to blame the legacy, but be inclusive, include the legacy into that, and then actually fix it later. So, agenda. So, I want to talk about, first talk about Edge, okay? It, edge, it is the component that split between two worlds, outside and inside. And then we talk about the core part of the mesh, like how service talk service together. And then I will talk about observability, and then come to some sort of summary and conclusions later. Um, Okay, so let's actually get started. Edge. Um, this is Nginx icon. And then I tried to actually put a heart there. I couldn't find a heart that I like. So um, I actually build, we actually build the Edge uh, with a combination of Nginx and Linkerd together. I think this is a relatively fairly rare combination. Let me explain why. Can you guys read this one? Okay, that's fairly clear here. So on top, that's a ELB. It's a load balancer, elastic load balancer from Amazon. Traffic coming down, so our client actually, uh, our mobile client actually come to here. 
but then go through ELP, and then they actually access the app using public URL. Okay, I will explain what the public URL actually look like, and then Nginx will apply a lot of policy there to normalize the URL, and then also filter out some of the uh, uh, CS CSR headers, and then deal with the security, do some transformations, and then get them in become a canonical URL. It's a URL that can be interpreted by Linkerd with data together. Okay, and then Linkerd actually has see this green thing here. Um, Linkerd actually has some of the uh, uh, our special setup with our special plugins. I will actually go into detail later to do authentication and also actually doing decider. Decider is a step that saying for this particular uh, 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 service, this amount of traffic go to this cluster, this amount of go to that cluster. That will allow us to do progressive rollout and then to actually do blank out and to actually do different experiments. Okay, so um, Linda D. So this diagram is actually I borrow or steal actually from Linkerd website. So we actually show you like Linkerd V1, the pipeline. Um, in specific, I would actually uh, uh, talk about a lot of the identification stage here. So this is so powerful. You can actually abuse it into, to do almost anything. Um, so let's talk about what Nginx actually does in our stack. Um, a request is coming into Nginx and usually come into a form like slash API message full bar something, right? So that's actually this line here. So that's a look like a perfect URL from outside. And we also use Nginx to do normalizations because when you have a monolith and then you're actually moving really fast, your URL system is actually very chaos to be fair, right? Because some of the random guy just, just saying, oh, your CTO wants to say, let's actually finish this feature by tonight, right? They actually expose an API in a form that not necessarily comply with any kind of standards. And then we actually rely on the Nginx to actually translate those special case into a more normalized case. And for example, in, in this here is, um, when we actually coming in um, slash API slash message slash full slash bar, we will actually have a pattern match in the Nginx translator to H1, HTML1, 1.1 actually. Region, that's a data center. Um, in Amazon, we have multiple data centers. Okay, we depends on the Nginx, we can actually inject different data center into that. Yeah. Front, that's a state. And then full bar, something. So after you get this URL, you then actually pass into the Linkerd layer. So um, in the Linkerd layer that you have this particular URL, you ingest this particular URL, and then they would, the Linkerd will actually talk to Namerd. Namerd, you can consider that as a mesh DNS. It's a DNS for the mesh. They will actually throw that to the Namerd, and Namerd will perform some magic. It's actually really magic at the at the first time that you actually read that, they want you to translate that, become host, port, and then the path. Throw it back to you. Okay, and then Linkerd will start to actually talk to that particular specific service. And here we will actually talk about, uh, uh, um, this is related to how routing and discovery actually work in the design. Um, I will actually uh, talk about that later. So let's drill down what happened inside the Linkerd. So you see this guy here? You guys see here, right? So this, zoom in. So when you have a monolith, usually depends on what framework that you use. For example, in Python, you use Django, right? Django has like one or two line, then you will have a Django authentication token, right? Magically, actually, it works. But when you actually start to try to break down your services together, you need to actually have somewhere to do the authentications. And ideally, I mean, at least what we believe, we did that on the edge. So, and the, the problem actually for that is Django authentication historically is a cookie system. So they give you a cookie, that cookie basically is very, very long string and with is encrypted and with something that actually really weird that can only be understood by the server side, okay? 
So, and then we just actually transit that become a JWT. It's a JSON web token system that with a signature there. So basically we have two ways to actually authenticate certain things. And, and I misspelled the transition, but I have a T there. So that transition is we actually have this particular module here, this particular uh, module here actually taking care of with some special logics. Okay, I want you to show that later. Um, that will actually handle both 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 kind of tran uh, translations, and then and give the header. So if basically the logic will be fairly simple, um, it will become like if you have this particular token, and then I will authenticate you. Otherwise, I fall back into the other way to to authenticate you. If you still fail, I will reject you. Okay. Otherwise, I will insert some special headers. So this is actually the exact logic that actually being built for this particular plugin. Um, I think first of all, you see that here, this all the identification identifier. Um, you have see this second identifier. So in Linkerd, the identifier can can stack each other, just like a filter. So a request coming in, the first identifier and the second identifier, you can consider that as a filter system. So and this particular code that will actually calling a packet name with this particular name in your in your in your jar system basically um and then you actually call this validated logic so by the way this is python code okay in case is it python code or scala code oh that's python okay so <laughs> so um the original one is a scala code that's much messier but uh, <laughs> i translated into python basically the thing is if header has jwt and then i validate jwt Otherwise, I proxy the authentication to an external service that we mentioned that this guy, this is another microservice actually running aside, that this guy actually has uh, know how to validate Django token, just put it that way, okay? And if it's successful, inject additional header there. So if something is successful, they will actually pull a header like something user ID, your user group, your permissions and so that you actually pass down the context into your subsequent services. So basically this is a logic. So um, any questions so far? Yes. Uh, was that off service that you uh, delegate that authorization to, is that also backed by Linkerd? Um, it is in ingress by Linkerd. Okay. Yeah. So we can also measure to remesh everything in there. So, okay, let's actually talk about the next step. Okay, let's actually explore this one. Um, experiment decider. The goal for this experiment decider for that is um, whenever we deploy a new service, a new version of service, we want to be able to control how much percent of the traffic go to the new service, how much percent go to the just blue green, right? Go to left or go to right. Um, the way that we actually, the way that you're doing that, we want that to be per service space, and then we want that to be sticky too. Sticky really means in the sense that, like, um, I want this particular set of user actually using that, or select by the set of user that called user ID set, or I want to actually get a user ID to actually really use murmur hash to actually shard it, so that they will actually go to a certain way to partition the user. Um, we have something that very smart in some sense that we have a special hash library that actually put in inside the in the Linkerd itself that actually written in Scala that actually does the trick. So you can read the config in the memory and that config without S3. Okay, let me actually put that here. Um, uh, read that out from S3 and then um, um, that particular config has a, a, um, a instruction actually saying that for services like this, and then I would do this kind of distribution for service like for, for chat service, I'm doing this distribution for search service, I'm doing that distributions. So, and then we will actually do that. Um, unavoidably, we need to actually show DTAP. So DTAP is actually one of the uh, most magical thing actually in Linkerd. Right, and um, there's a lot of pros and cons in there. I don't want to get into that too much. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. So a DTAP basically is a, a DSL for routing. So it is actually a uh, a backtrace. So when whenever you have a DTAP, you have the your your highest priority rule is at the bottom, so you can evaluate that. Just I don't want to actually get too much into that. Um, there's a link actually here. You can search link the DTAP. You will actually get get the documentations. But overall, you see this particular rule here. It's just saying like for productions, and then go to canary. You see this one? This is this is a protocol. This is data center. Production, go to Canary. And for this one, it is like for all the production message, 50% go to messaging, production messaging, and 15%, 50% actually go to Canary. So basically, this is actually uh, what the DTAP actually does. Let's get back to um, uh, um, how, how we actually do that here. We actually have a plugin. So this is on the high level. A user request coming into the routing edge, and then we control the link ID here to so just split the traffic in per service uh, manner. So this is how it's being done. Um, this is a config. Okay, um, so we got to call that Expresso. And then um, why we call that Expresso? Because I have a typo there. Um, and then it becomes the package name. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I want to call it Express, and then for some reason that become Express. So, um, yeah. Um, so this is config actually there. So this is actually identifier. We actually inherit the identifier. It's called what is it called? It's an IO L5D path. So we implement that here. So um, the logic actually for that is fairly simple. Okay, basically just like for every single traffic actually coming in here, and we literally actually run an Expresso library, let's say SHA this one, and then pass it a request context. Maybe here is a request ID, and then the request service. And then what they actually return to me is they will update the context for that. So they will actually either override your header if it doesn't override your header, so that it will identify you into the correct service. Um, so pretty much. Uh, we actually go through two plugin. Okay, one is authentication, and now the one is experiment. Um, so let's talk about um, on the edge. Uh, the pros and cons for the uh, uh, for the current edge design is uh, one. It is horizontal <coughs> scale ready. So as your traffic actually keep coming in, because every single box is stateless, so you can add as many boxes as you want into there. So you you are actually really really well tolerated. It is also region aware. So you can have like multiple region actually uh, uh, into there. Then you can route the traffic into the your specific regions. Um, you actually separate the external and internal API and policy. So because you now actually have the best of both worlds. One is Nginx. Nginx is so powerful that you can almost do anything for that uh, if you know how to do it. Um, <laughs> and then you know, and also you know how to debug it. <laughs> Um, and also Linkerd, Linkerd is actually very relatively very easy to use, and then it's a very programmable. So you can actually have that into that component. And the cons for that is you mentioned us, you have an Nginx, you have an engine, you have the Linkerd. How much CPU do we waste? We actually waste around one hundred percent, fifty percent. So if uh, I actually did the measurement here, when the traffic all coming in here, um, the Linkerd CPU usage. Is almost identical to the Nginx CPU usage, as long as the JVM market warm up. So we roughly actually waste like we double the CPU usage, but it's it's a good trade off in my opinion for that because um, it's just the edge, and then we as we scale, and then we just add more compute boxes there, and it works fine. So. Okay, let's start to zoom in a little bit here. So we just finished the edge, right? That's a, the topmost level. Let's start to zoom in here. Um, talk about the mesh itself. Um, we actually largely use EC2 boxes um, for now, okay? Um, and then in each of the EC2 box, and then we have a Linkerd sidecar actually running into that. And then every single Linkerd sidecar, it has three key components. One is an ingress port, one is egress port. Another one is an announcer. 
I will talk about the announcer later. So um, for LinkedIn, for, for within our mesh, we actually support two protocol, HTTP v1 and then FRIF. For majority for the high traffic component, we always use FRIF. So that um, I think we actually benchmarked it. FRIF is around 10 times faster than HTTP v1. And I will also actually show you the latency for that later. Um, why are we actually have the ingress and egress for LinkedIn? It's mainly for control and observability because in that way we fully control the traffic. And with the power of the uh, the DTAP, we can actually pretty much actually do anything for our ingress and egress. We pretty much can say for all the services that between service A and service B, we do this, then we can reroute it in, in, in real time. Um, so let's just go through this uh, architecture diagram. So um, this is an EC2 box. Within that, we have a LinkedIn process that you're running, just one single process. And then it has two ports. One is the ingress port. This port is actually where uh, 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 all the inbound traffic. So no traffic would actually talk to the app directly. They always talk through the ingress. And then for egress for the, for the, for the applications, we set a firewall. We don't allow anyone to actually really actually we don't allow the app to actually talk out. They can only actually talk to the egress port, okay? And the egress port actually getting out from uh, 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 from uh, to outside. In that way, then we fully control the in and out, and then all the activity of these particular applications it is actually controlled, okay? And I will also show you the benefit for that later, which indicating that um, because a lot of the application here is um, written in Python. And when you have a Python running a Django, running a Django, Django stuff, and then with Python, and then the way that the Django connection pool is very suboptimal. So when an application try to actually talk out there without a proper application, uh, without without a proper connection pool, the performance actually suffer a lot. And then after apply the LinkedIn into that as all the egress, we actually saw like half cut of the connections. Or for our bank, um, I will I will talk about that later because um, in that case, all these application, what they actually think about that is whenever they actually uh, receive the traffic is always from local host. Whenever they actually talk out is always from local host as well. So the application doesn't aware of they need to talk to outside, so they don't need to know other services. And announcer, um, I will actually drill down a little bit here later. Um, announcer is a special. Uh, 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 um, it is actually um, the second. It's actually in the discovery v two because at the beginning we don't have the announcer. Um, we put the announcer actually in here is to uh, uh, help us to for for doing survey discovery without any other without the need to actually install other stuff. So I want you to talk about that later. Okay. So we have two ways to actually discover uh, other service. So from one service perspective, how you know other service, right? We have two versions. It actually took us like uh, 12 months to actually for the transitions. For V1, for discovery V1, um, we actually use console-based discovery. This is a very quick way to actually do that. You can probably just read the documentation. You can actually do that in maybe one way. So I get everything set up and working really well. And V2 is actually much more complex, but I will actually call that sophisticated way to actually do the discovery. Let's actually drill down a little to bit here. So, um, survey discovery, the, the nature of survey discovery, it is like this. It is, I give you a name of service, you give me all the machines, basically. That's just on the high level, how service discovery is actually being done. And depends on who you actually talk to. And a lot of the time, the survey discovery has a lot of special feature, like it has to be super consistent, uh, highly available, full tolerate, you can actually kill half of the fleet, it's still actually working. And yeah, that's actually the requirement. In our context, we actually use EC2 auto scaling groups. So uh, for that is in the EC2 auto scaling group this, there's no easy way to actually say, give me all the machines for this particular service, besides calling Amazon uh, uh, EC2 API. If you keep calling Amazon EC2 API, they will rate for to you. And then the latency of the Amazon EC2 API is horrible. It can actually take to up to like 30 seconds and then give you a timeout. 
So that's the first one. Is our um, the V one? It's our box experience. Um, it's a, it's very easy to implement. So what we actually use for that is in each of the console. At each of we use console to actually do that. At the time that when we are doing console, console was at version 0.8, 0.8 was a beta beta program <laughs> that we actually use. The way that we actually do that is we register the service, and then we also put the address of the ELB into the service. So whenever you ask console, say, "Oh, where are my my messaging service?" Right, and then they, what they actually return to you, they just return a, a a a DNS for you, and then they actually resolve the DNS and just give you something. So basically, it's very simple. So as a result, this is what it will look like. So a service talk to other service always through their ELB. Okay. And why you may actually ask why we didn't actually use console agent? Um, because as at that time, console wasn't actually really mature at that particular point. And adding a console agent that's another program actually uh, we need to take care about for every single box. And that's why we actually didn't do that. And then, uh, yeah, you actually see why we why that was actually a good choice anyway. Um, okay, all good. Um, so if we actually use console, so we will have this diagram. This this one is like all the service talk to other service through ELP. All good, right? But why do we actually want something actually better? Because this way if we actually oversimplify the network topology. And then LinkedIn doesn't have the full network topology. I give you um, an example, right? Whenever you have retry budget, LinkedIn when they talk to another node, right? And then every single time your retry budget totally broken because they can't actually do retry budget for per host. They, the retry budget is on per ELB box. So when they actually have a retry budget, when the retry budget is really applied there, you lost half of your fleet. So we can't actually turn on retry budgets. And then all the back off doesn't work neither. So because we are talking to a balance, uh, low balancer, and also ELB, ELB doesn't actually balance really well um, when you actually really actually doing the low balancing here. Because of why I'm saying that? Because I was the one that actually wrote that ELB when I was in Amazon. <laughs> yes, and then the ELB doesn't actually work well with your whiskey neither. Um, that was the part that I put in there. <laughs> According, no, just PM asked me to do that, and that's a fact. So, yeah, that was actually the some of the history that embedded in there. So I know it really well. Why it doesn't? Um, after we had the V one, right, and then we want something better. We of course after we put that V one there, we have a lot of minor incidents because already a known thing like a ELB node just go nowhere, and then we get a stuck DNS, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, and then we have the imbalance things because the ELB doesn't actually balance well and all that sort of stuff. And then we don't have the flexibility to actually use different kind of low balancer strategy. So we have the V2. We want the V2 to be peer to peer. That means it's like all the node talk to other node directly. Um, we want to actually use a very powerful uh, load balancing algorithm. So I just list out a bunch of them that I just shoot a finagle. Uh, we actually and at that point, I think uh, on the name of D, we actually support io.l5d.dnssrv. Um, we actually start to support the, uh, the SRV record. Um, anyone should know as what SRV is? Okay. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> That's the next slide there. Um, SRV, it is actually um, a, a type of, uh, it's a DNS type. It's just like um, a C name for a group machine. Okay, you can actually go to uh, Amazon Route 53 and create a C name rec uh, SRV record to so immediately know how it works. So um, the the inside SRV record, as you can see, that the format is actually pretty wonderful. Your priority, a uh, weight, and port, and the host or IP, right? So that means you can actually pretty much actually put all your record there. As you're saying, like uh, priority ten, weight five. That's a port that you your service is, and then you can put the IP there. So you can have a list of the machine actually in there. So far, so good. Now, um, you can actually see, uh, uh, um, I don't know, do we actually have any kind of public SRV record somewhere? I, I don't know any, so, and that's why I, I just get a Google one. So that's one there. So 
because usually SRV actually using within your uh, administration domain. It's very rare that they actually expose the outside. Um, so, yeah, um, that's where that announcer actually came in here. That's this guy. So we actually have an in Linkerd, there's a there's a plugin called announcer, a stage or plugin actually called announcer there. We actually override it. Okay, and then when Linkerd actually started, start up, okay, it will announce itself to DynamoDB. We call that flip DB. Okay, so whenever actually start start up, it will actually announce what does it announce? It actually announced the IP address it is actually on there and then the app. The port of the app, the, the no, I mean the 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 the, the ingress port that is listening to. Um, after they actually announced there, and then the DB actually has something. Uh, it actually know what it is in there. So this is actually the uh, uh, more detailed architecture. So when the LinkedIn actually start up, they announce it into the Fleet DB. Okay, this DB is actually hosted in Amazon Dynamo. So we don't need to actually host any other database anymore, okay? And then when we actually announce into the FlipDB into that, we will periodically announce into that. And then also when we actually announce to the FlipDB, we have expiry time. That record has expiry time. So if you announce it, they announce it, announce there, and then your box actually die, and then that entry will get disappear down on the road. And then we also have a flip sync service here, so we periodically randomly actually sample the AS3 and try to actually sync it up. And also we have a, a, a matrix sync service here. So we actually try to, um, okay, I will talk about this later because this will actually involve how we actually collect the metrics. This is how it's actually being done. So this is an announcer. Then we actually have a whole bunch of the config. And this is the Dynamo table. Local here is actually means use the local credential. We can actually inject the credential here. And then uh, we actually talk about the health check config. So how how get in the link to each other, health check the, the applications. Um, this is actually a record actually uh, written in the flip DB. Um, in specific, you actually see that it has a there's a lag MS. Basically to try to calculate like when the last time the successful uh, checking is, and then what the time it is that now. And then we also have like expiration time, all that sort of metadata to actually help the SRV record to actually know that when the last time that was being checked successfully. Okay, so after actually being done, that's actually the first immediate things that we we, uh, we actually observe. Uh, we now actually letting the SRV, uh, letting LinkedIn talk to LinkedIn directly without talking to the ELB. And then you can actually see that here is, this is a connection count. And then you actually see the connection actually drop here after the deploy. So it's actually around from 6 million, it was actually around 10 million. All of a sudden it actually dropped. So that means it's like the total number of maintained connection within our fleet actually dropped, which is a good thing. Because that way, that means really the connection pool actually really kicking in. It's a, such a good thing to do. This, this is a new connection. So we don't we don't keep establishing new connection anymore. And this is actually the the latency graph that for fifth service. That's before, and then after you deploy the, and then it drops. Um, I think this one is P ninety nine. That's a P fifty. Green line is P fifty, and this is P ninety nine. So at the P99 for the latency between two between uh, uh, two service now actually dropped well below one MS. It's insanely fast. Before that was actually three, become one. That's three hundred percent improvement, right? <laughs> yeah, that's actually the power of like the optimization to allow note to note actually conversations. Um, this is this. What is this? Why is it here? Um, okay, <laughs> so uh, this is CloudWatch. Okay, so when you actually talk about in ELB, you have very limited choice of metrics because everything costs money in ELB. Of course, CloudWatch also also costs money too. But now we have the ability because the LinkedIn actually control 
the in and out, and then note to note, we can actually emit some of the very awesome uh, metrics actually into there. Uh, what is this one? For example, there's a number of the millisecond of the latency for ingress and the egress per service. Note to note. Okay, we can actually emit the metrics like from service A to service B, what's the latency between these two in a pair. We can actually emit something like that. After you actually control the full mesh, the full graph, that's the power that you get. So that's before, and this is after. Um, yeah, I just try to outline uh, uh, the, pow the power of having the LinkedIn mesh in here. So for alerting, um, we have the Cloud Watch and then Cloud Watch page, page duty. And after that, observer, we will talk about observer later. Observer, it is actually our observability uh, service, okay? Observer to pager duty. And then for auto scaling group, you have before, you have the ELB latency based, CPU based, unhealthy host. And then after that, we have latency based, CPU based, unhealthy host based, and connection based. So we can actually count the number of connections. We can even actually do a lot in some of the very weird thing that if a service has more than n connection to service A to so service B, right? Between this pair, you can alert that as well. Just in case some of the service has start to act up. So, yeah, observability. So, yeah. How, how common does that happen? Does that case happen? It's very common because we have a lot of legacy service, and those services such um, they're not necessarily really good. It's not that well behaved. So we actually really actually have some sort of pair of the service that like it's always you basically those kind of pattern. So we actually start to set up some alert actually into that, especially when you uh, uh, the on this real time system, uh, metrics and observability is the key there because whenever uh, there's a blip of the service, the whole site actually have a blip on the on the latency. It's very important to actually catch who actually did that at that particular moment to avoid. It's, it's also a culture thing, right? Try to actually hold each of the team more accountable. So um, that's just part for observability too. So on LinkedIn, LinkedIn is so powerful that actually provide extremely good observability. I think something is just so good that, oh, wow, I can't live without. <laughs> we use Grafana and Permissus to actually do that. Let's get back to this diagram. Let's take a look at that here. Okay, so we actually run a, a permissive service. The permissive service has a, a config to try to scrape the things from LinkedIn. That's what this line is. And then this guy actually try to actually get get a host from the, the FlipDB. Basically, he periodically actually asking, every five seconds actually asking, hey, tell me all the nodes for chat service. Or messaging service, and then this guy will give you all the notes actually there, and then you try to scrape those things every single five seconds on the permissions parking. And then they actually you we actually use Grafana to actually build the dashboards. And the end result for this service, we have half million metrics, um, five to ten second interval. I think we actually adjust that to ten because five seconds is way too much. Um, and then some of the metrics actually published, the selective set of metrics actually published to Cloud, Cloud Watch, and so that we have like better dashboard, I mean, and then link up into our legacy systems. So at the end, that's some of the graph. So you see this graph? This is actually when we actually deploy a new service. And then for here, it's so, so colorful that um, that's per box. So we actually show the per box also how to shift out on the deployment. So if you actually mouse on top, you actually tell you which box that is or what the IP is. And this one is HTTP code. So when we are actually deploying, when we're actually deploying that, and then we actually see the old, the old, the, the HTTP 200 from the old fleet is replacing by the HTTP 200 of the new fleet. So we actually know the transition for that. And this one is actually also like from a single service perspective, we actually know that we're the sources of every single, uh, who is calling you. So every single car represents a service. 
So conclusions, um, we have a full mesh. It's, it's so powerful. All the inbound and outbound services are observable by the LinkedIn. -E. And the A-B test is so easy as it's, it's possible that we can actually do that in the edge level and the service level as well. Um, all the traffic between two nodes are controlled by LinkerD, and then we can actually use DTAP rule to really control that to actually drop traffic to actually uh, do anything that we want, almost anything that we want. Um, all the communication are point to point. ELB doesn't actually serve any traffic, yeah, but we still keep the ELB because if you use the ELB without paying the traffic bill, it's such a good deal because we use the ELB to actually do healthy host check. So we have additional signal on what's going on. We get the ELB to check our LinkerD. So LinkerD is actually checking our applications. And then we pay almost nothing on the ELB without paying the traffic. Um, and also ability to partial blank out the traffic, for example, this line. For everything that going to messaging, and then 50% go to still go to messaging, and then 50% actually fail the traffic. So in that way you can you can shape the traffic in real time. And also JVM9 plus actually has much better GC. And then we actually saw that like, um, we, actually, we actually saw before when we were using uh, JVM8, we see the things very jittery on the, on the P99. But after we actually switched that and all the jittery actually almost gone. So they went that I want to actually complain about the JVM, but at the end, it's not really a big deal that we really worry about at that point. So thank you. Okay. Any question? Yeah. You said like the CPU would double. What hmm? other costs? Like um, yes, 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 yes. I think I should also mention that um, I think the LinkerD actually literally using 1.5 core. So it depends on the size of your box. In this way, then your deployment can't be too small. So because we're using like EC2 instance, right? So as long as your box is reasonably large, like for example, like five, five core, six core, then it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. So that's actually a trade-off as well. Uh, but the good thing for that is, with this architecture, you can almost proxy to anything, including serverless, including Kubernetes. So we have mixed serverless and Kubernetes. We have some serverless like the Lambda thing. We proxy that into the API gateway because you really actually consider that as a an application endpoint, right? And then also Kubernetes as well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again, Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. So we're going to take a five-minute break and then come back and hear from Kevin.